Hey everyone, a very good evening to all of you. I'm Roma and I'll be the host for today's event. Welcome to the first ever virtual meetup from Tech Talks at Symbol. I hope you all have settled down and have grabbed your cup of coffee or tea so that we can begin a session where speakers will be sharing their remarkable insights about the field of data science. Symbol.ai, previously Rama, is a Techstars backed early stage AI startup that adds real time conversational intelligence to meetings without having to say any voice commands. It is a complete conversation intelligence API platform that can be natively integrated into any platform or business. We are, first, we are the first fully programmable interface that analyzes free-flowing, human-to-human -human natural conversations to generate shared knowledge across knowledge workers. Tech Talks at Symbol is a new series of events and meetups organized by Symbol.ai to promote dialogue and knowledge sharing on the latest technology. So the topic for today's meetup is comprehending conversations and galaxies the deep learning way. Today, our speakers will enlighten us about the diverse applications of deep learning in the field of conversational intelligence and astrophysics. Our speakers will be sharing their thoughts, learnings, takeaways, and acquired wisdom about how to solve some high-level problems from these fields. Now, I'd like to request my co-host, Mayur, to tell you all about some guidelines that we all need to follow during the course of the event. Over to you, Mayur. Hey, Roma, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Hope you all are doing good. I would like to walk you through some of the simple but necessary guidelines for the event to ensure it's hassle-free and works in the best interest of everyone. To start with, first of all, you would, have, you would have noticed that all participants have been muted by default, and we would request you to keep it that way so that we have minimum to no distraction. We would be running a couple of polls during the talks to keep the session interactive and we would encourage you to vote. Lastly, we would be running the Q&A at the end of each talk and would try not to exceed it for more than 10 to 15 minutes. So feel free to drop your questions, if any, in the chat as the speaker is delivering the content. The speaker will try to answer as many queries and questions possible, but given the limited time we have, I would encourage you to send over your questions to meetup.symbol.ai in case we are not able to take it over here. With that, we're done with the guidelines. I hope you enjoy the sessions and over to you, Roma. Hey, thanks a lot, Mayur. Guys, now let's begin with the first session. I'd like to introduce a first speaker to all of you. Sekhar, a mechanical engineer by degree, used to work as an executive engineer at MRF Tires Limited for a little more than a year after his graduation. At the end of that tenure, as he started exploring different areas that would be more exciting, his research led him to the up and coming field of data science. He started with learning Python and moved on to machine learning. And not far later, his innate adoration for math and calculus worked as a natural magnet to nudge him towards the field of neural networks and deep learning. He's, he's been working as a data scientist at symbol.ai for the last two years, applying his acquired skill sets on one of the most challenging domain in artificial intelligence today, unstructured, free-flowing, human-to-human -human conversations. His penchant for devouring any content related to neuropsychology or psychology in general has helped him immensely in his attempts at breaking down the monolithic challenge. He truly believes AI still has a massive scope to learn from the OG intelligence, the human brain. Today, he's going to be speaking about ensemble approach to deep learning models at symbol.a. Welcome, Shekhar. I request you to please start your session. Thank you. Thank you, Roma and Mayu, for that introduction. So, I'll start off with sharing my screen. So, um, I'll start off with uh, asking you all a basic question uh, just to get the general mood of the audience. Uh, the nation wants to know, and I want to know as well. So, the first question that's going to be popping up to you as a poll right now is. How many of you think that general intelligence can be achieved uh, by or before 2050? So by general intelligence, what I mean is that um, something uh, that a machine is capable of uh, in terms of human level intelligence, as in a, a machine can do anything that a human can do, basically learn things on the fly, adapt to different challenges, 
and basically you function just as uh, a normal human brain would be doing uh, at its adult stage. So this is something that I would like to know. I would like to uh, gauge uh, the mood of the audience today. Yeah, Shekhar, let's give it a minute. People are voting. Yeah. As you can see, one of the options is that you disagree that uh, it can be ever achieved as well. So that also is an option for you guys, uh, that this can never happen. Like a machine can never um, be at the level of a human. That's also an option. So yeah, give me your choices. Uh, guys, this is voting that's happening. So I see some people chatting, so, you know. Okay, I think um, we have fair amount of responses. Um, I can end the poll. And I'm going to share the results now. All right. So, mm, yeah, I guess everyone's gone for the diplomatic approach. Maybe. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Mayur, if you can um, stop that poll sharing result. Um, yep. But yeah. Um, that's the still there. Um, okay, um, I'll just continue with it and hope that um, that poll result goes away. So um, basically, now that um, I know how you all think about AI and how, like what your futuristic vision of uh, general intelligence is, this is a meme that I came across uh, a while back. The 90s movies always used to tell us that AI might kill us in the future, right? And the current state of AI uh, just identifies uh, a cat to be a dog. But we all know, but most of us know that this is not true because most of the image recognition systems today actually have much better understanding of uh, how a cat and dog are different. And uh, although uh, image recognition is pretty much uh, solved these days, the thing is um, when AI is being applied to other fields uh, such as uh, text, the natural language and conversations and the sort, um, AI at its, uh, at its uh, present stage can still make these kind of uh, juvenile errors. And uh, that's why this meme is always relevant. I mean, always relevant given the present time frame. So uh, with that, um, I'll move on to the title of my presentation, which is one model to rule them all. Mm, well, not exactly because one model can't learn everything if uh, recent uh, things are to be believed. And the topic is um, ensembling models and uh, creating hybrid intelligence. And this is going to be what I'm talking about today. And I'm Shekhar. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Symbol.ai. And we try to decode conversations. Um, Mayur, I can still see the, the poll results. Oh, let me check this one. Do you still see it? Yes, I do. Hey, I think uh, you'll have to close it from your end. Mm, I can't, okay. Oh. Right. Okay. Does it work for you, Shrika? Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, um, let's uh, dive in. So what is it uh, that I'm talking about over here, right? So ensembling, first of all, it's important to define what an ensemble is, right? So an ensemble can have uh, different definitions, but the core idea is that uh, you group together a set of uh, machine learning or deep learning models so that uh, better predictions can be made um, as opposed to uh, having individual models that give out just uh, uh, individual predictions. And um, essentially the question then becomes, why do we need to do this? Why can't we just um, go with the, the single model approach that uh, we've come to see so far, right? So let's dig a bit more into that. And um, uh, as Roma mentioned, I still believe the brain is the OG intelligence, the original gangster of intelligence and this is the holy grail for all AI and this is what every system uh, strives to be. This is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow or the light at the end of the tunnel, however you may phrase it. This is what they all strive to be, right? And it's the end game for all intelligent systems. And the current state of AI has only taken baby steps in this direction. Image recognition as we know uh, is pretty much solved, but there are other areas in terms of general intelligence that uh, that are still open research areas. And as I still, as um, Roma mentioned in the introduction, I still believe that AI can learn a lot from how the human brain functions. So um, I'll just uh, show you guys a quick uh, snippet of video. Um, the purpose of this video is twofold. 
And the first purpose is to ge just generally understand how a neural net functions. And the second is to somehow uh, find, uh, draw parallels between uh, how the human brain functions and how a neural net functions. So for this, I'll have to just uh, tweak my mic settings a bit. So um, you won't be able to hear me. I'll just uh, let this video continue, play through. And after that, I'll continue with the presentation. So yeah, the video. Listen to this. Sounded strange, right? Have a listen again and see if you can get anything. Still strange. Now listen to this. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. <laughs> Which I do. Um, so you heard some words there, right? Now listen to the first sound again. I'm just going to replay it. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. Yeah? So you can now hear words there. Once more for luck. All right, um, I hope that all of you um, heard that. So, um, the title of this video is Your Brain Hallucinates Conscious Reality, and it's by a neuroscientist called Anil Seth. Uh, you can uh, um, watch it online on YouTube. And uh, I um, highly recommend watching this in full. It's pretty informative and uh, interesting. So, um, as I said, what just happened here? So, there were different parts uh, of your brain that uh, processed all of this information, right? So the auditory cortex in your brain heard the different sounds, then the language areas and the mathematical areas, which is the general interpretive region of the brain, uh, identified at these speeds, then further concluded that it was English, and uh, it finally sh uh, stored it in short-term memory, right? Because um, the, the the sentence was just, uh, just uh, spoken once, and it was stored in your short-term memory so that you could associate it with the sound signal. And all this complex interconnectivity between this di these different streams of information that happened in the blink of an eye, right? It just happened less than a fraction of a second. And it was done with such astounding accuracy that was, we're left wondering what really happened because we just don't know. Um, it just happened just like that, so efficiently. And um, what really happened over here is that the incoming sound signal, which we couldn't understand head or tail of, of earlier, just uh, made sense once we could map it with uh, a language that we already knew and which was uh, stored in short-term memory. So as I said, the purpose of that video was twofold, right? The first purpose was obviously to um, just uh, shed light on how a neural net functions. And how a neural net functions is basically what you saw in the video. You feed the neural network a stream of raw data, which in this case was uh, the sound signal, which didn't make sense at all. And then you feed it a label that has to be associated with that particular uh, data point that you sent it. In this case, that was, um, the, I think Brexit is a terrible idea, that statement. So, and it's the job of the neural network to find out the mapping, um, find out the mapping function through its, um, uh, its neurons that make up the neural network. Find out the mapping that can make uh, the inputs, uh, input sound signal transform or translate into uh, the words that you heard later on. That is how a neural net functions and you feed it a lot of data. Function approximator just uh, maps the data point onto the target label that we give it. And the second point was about uh, how we can draw parallels, right? So let's look at that for a moment. The first and um, obvious choice is how neural networks are named, right? They're named uh, on the basis of the basic unit of the brain, which is a neuron. And in both of these cases, uh, neurons actually interact uh, with each other to predict outcomes. And um, th this happens for both uh, the brain and the neural net. And uh, as we know, in the brain, there are different areas that process uh, different streams of information. The auditory cortex uh, processes audio information, the visual cortex processes visual information, separate areas for language and mathematics. And uh, there are these uh, distinct, um, I wouldn't say distinct, because uh, recent research uh, suggests that um, the boundaries between all these uh, different areas is a bit fuzzy and everything is just a mesh of everything else. Uh, but there are specially demarcated areas, um, at least, um, um, in the short, uh, short term of things. Um, and that's the specialized areas that are there for specific functions. Um, and when it comes to neural nets, uh, the same thing applies because uh, we've come to know that uh, the first uh, few layers in the neural network actually uh, learn the low level features of uh, whatever it's trying to learn. And as you progress through the layers of the neural network, uh, it just transforms all of those low level features into high level features so that um, it can understand the problem better. So initial layers, low level features, and as you progress through the layers, you get uh, the higher level features. 
And another thing is that there are specializations within these specialized areas, both for the brain and uh, the neural net, because in the brain itself, um, even though there's a specific language area, there are specific areas inside that, um, that area, which actually focus on the phonological aspects or uh, the semantic and syntactical aspects, uh, as you'll see in a bit. Um, so even in neural nets as well, uh, the first layer, maybe some neurons are uh, just, uh, so for example, if it's an image classification task, some neurons find out what the edges of one particular object in the image are, another set of neurons find out what the edges uh, in another object are, and all of these combine to form uh, high level features, like when edges combine to form the shape of a face or the shape of a mouth and stuff like that. And this is actually the clincher. We are still unclear on the exact underlying mechanisms that make both of these tick. So although there has been an explosion of research in the last uh, 20, 25 years in both of these areas, um, we still have just barely scratched the surface of understanding how these things actually work. For example, in that video we just saw, right? So uh, nobody actually told you, the guy in the video didn't tell you, I didn't tell you to actually map those words onto the sound signal. Your, your brain just automatically did that. And uh, that is one of the hallmarks that we still can't understand why we did it. We just know that it, it just did it, right? And um, generally that is the purpose of the human brain, right? To make the best predictions given the data that it has so that it can make sense of this crazy world that we live in. And this is something um, that we do at Simple, right? Um, applying uh, machine learning and uh, deep learning to natural language and conversation. That this is essentially the hallmark of, of being a human. Right, and this is what um, primarily separates us from other species on the planet. And uh, this was actually this was actually um, uh, a study that was conducted a couple of years ago, uh, which was titled "Expanding Methodology for Cortical Premapping of, la of uh, Language Functions." So, as you can see over here, there are different areas uh, marked uh, on the brain itself, which cater to the phonological, the semantic, and the syntactical aspects of language. So phonological is how different uh, sounds make words in the language that you're listening to. Semantics is about what different words inside the language mean. And syntax is about the general grammatical structure that, um, that, is, um, natural, that is related to a language. So there are different areas that are spread across different parts of the brain that actually cater to these broken down aspects of language. And um, as I said, ML and AI are making inroads into this kind of field with uh, natural language and conversations, but there's uh, still a long way to go. So, well, as I keep saying that we are making inroads, let's just take a look at the journey so far. I'm just going to be explaining, um, just um, briefing upon uh, some of the major advances that have actually been there um, in this field. One was obviously, the first was obviously the word embeddings that was uh, developed by Thomas McClough um, et al. in 2013. Word embeddings is essentially just um, mapping meaning onto separate words. As humans, we understand what a word means, but for a computer, it means numbers, right? So what word embeddings do it, it transforms each and every word into 50 or 100 or 300 features and each of these features is a number. So uh, a feature can be anything that is associated with a word, right? So for example, if you take the word apple, um, it is red in color, that, that's a feature, it is red in color. Another feature is that it's edible. Uh, another feature is that it's a fruit. Another feature is that it does not have a gender. So there are these 300, like uh, maybe 300 or 500 or how many features that you have. And the job of the word embedding is to transform the word into these separate 300 or 500 dimensional uh, numbers so that the computer can get a sense of what it actually, what the word actually means. And RNNs are recurrent neural nets, which are sequential models. So word embeddings work on word level and RNNs work on phrases or sentence level, which is a combination of words. And this is basically um, what uh, what has been used extensively so far in LSTMs is a short to long, short to memory, and GRU is a short for uh, uh, gated recurrent units. I won't go into the details of this because um, that is beyond the scope of this presentation. But the basic idea is that this um, actually um, maintains context throughout the different words inside a sentence. As you go through sentence word by word, it tries to maintain the context of each and every word, the plurality or the gender, and um, different different um, aspects of the language. And this is what uh, the recurrent neural networks do. And attention was another milestone that actually powers the, the neural machine translation systems that we see today. Um, it actually uh, is more in, in line with um, how humans would translate it. So what attention basically does is, given a source text and um, a target text, what it does is for each word in the target text, it tries to find out what the closest word is in the source text so that um, it doesn't, so that each word in the target text doesn't really 
uh, focus on each and every word inside the source text. It just needs to know which one to focus on. And as neural networks do, it does it through constant iteration over lots of training data. And transformers um, are, in, um, are, in, uh, are a different form of uh, sequential models itself, which is much more efficient. And it is based on the, the attention principle itself. And the paper itself is titled, Attention is All You Need. So it's based on the attention mechanism and something called the positional embeddings, which uh, encode the, the positional nature of each and every word, each and every part of speech inside uh, a sentence. And this transformer has been uh, the building block of what we now know to be BERT, which I think all of you must have heard, every data scientist who works in a natural language will have heard of BERT. It was developed by Google, and it's a language model that um, that has bidirectionality associated with it, and it can store much more context um, as opposed to the previous um, versions of language models that came in. And Excellent and Ernie are just basically better versions of BERT. The, the underlying architecture and the mechanism to train is the same, but it's just a bit more complex than BERT. And these are actually improvements on BERT that addressed some of the shortcomings that BERT had. Now, um, this is the main topic, right? Uh, take, uh, so ensembling is the main topic. So let's take a leap from the bagging. But bagging, uh, as you might know, is um, how you combine decision trees together. So that uh, a lot of decision trees combine together to uh, give us a fine knot, but like a random forest um, and general bagging classifiers in, uh, in machine learning. So, and this concept is uh, what we do, this concept of uh, weak learners getting aggregated. So. Is that right? when a single model is um, is not enough to learn everything, you've got to create a lot of them and create an ensemble. And apes together strong. That's the model we follow, right? Um, each individual model preserves its strengths, while their combination gives us a model that's much more robust. And um, the question then arises: When should we do this, and uh, why should we do this, right? So obviously, the first one would be the lack of quality training data. This is something. This is a problem that all data scientists phase, um, we never have enough data, right? So um, that is obviously one area where it can be applied to. And when this happens in, in tandem with the problem statement itself being too complex, and when the problem statement has uh, individual sub problems, this, is, this forms a deadly combination. And uh, one single model won't be able to learn all the different sub parts that are there in the, in, there in the data that, that are there to be mapped actually. So you will need uh, to break down those, uh, those uh, that break problem into different different uh, subparts so that it can be worked upon individually. And to an extent, this can actually uh, mitigate the issue of uh, precision recall trade-off, which uh, most of us data scientists know. Uh, so precision recall trade-off. So uh, it basically means that uh, when you develop a model, right? So uh, it can, so it can never be that uh, the chances are highly uh, unlikely that you have a model that is both high in precision and high in recall. Uh, so the most in most outcomes, you, you'll get a model with either high precision or high recall, but not really both being high. So um, suppose um, you were experimenting on a, on a problem statement and you uh, iterate through it and you have different, different models and you find out that one of the models actually is good at precision and one of the models good at recall and one of the model has a bit of both so that the F1 is balanced, right? And if you've got a problem statement wherein um, you've got a business requirement wherein um, you've got to have something, uh, you've got to have a result that is high on both precision and recall, then we'll have to figure out a way to ensemble this, this high precision model and high recall model together so that um, the business requirement is met. And if you do it carefully, this can be solved to an extent. And Obviously, we can increase the overall prediction quality through this comp the, through this aggregation of uh, weak learners that are domain specific, that are strong in their specific domains. Let's just briefly look at uh, the ensemble techniques that we can use. Um, this is just a basic outline of how you can uh, ensemble it, ensemble it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be just three models; it can be n number of models, and also it doesn't have to be a neural net. It can be any machine learning model, right? And it doesn't even have to be uh, a single output. It can have multiple outputs. And uh, the, the core idea over here is to combine all of these into something that can possibly get us a better result. And that is the crux of this slide, the one that you see on uh, the right over here, linear slash nonlinear combination of outputs. That's where the essence of uh, ensembling lies. So let's just uh, look at how we can do that. Uh, let's uh, look at linear combinations first. 
And the first choice is majority voting. I wouldn't say this is an ensemble technique. This is more of a democratic approach um, to machine learning. Majority voting is when you have a set of different models and um, you're just taking the majority vote. So if it's a classification problem, you're just going by uh, the majority voting, uh, whether it's one or a zero, if it's a binary classification problem. So it's going with the majority of the ensemble that you created. Another is uh, the average of the outputs across all the models. And uh, this has lesser chances of working um, towards getting us a better result because averaging it doesn't really tend to make a difference um, difference on the best performing model. It, it performs um, basically on par with that, uh, at least in uh, most of the use cases. So um, what makes things more interesting is when you have a weighted average, right? So in that way, you can actually control um, what you want to give more weightage to. If there's any particular model that you want to give more weightage to, you can fine tune those parameters so that um, the weighted average um, gets you closer to what your actual requirement is. And another thing is, so suppose you have like maybe 100 different models in the ensemble, right? In that case, uh, manually fine tuning each and every uh, weight for um, each, each of these 100 models becomes a tedious task. And for that, maybe you can uh, devise a small simple function, uh, which is linear in nature, by which you can just uh, change the value of this controllable variable that you have. And the, by changing this value, you can change each and every um, each and every weight of each and every um, individual model that makes up the ensemble. So these are linear combinations. And uh, let's look at the nonlinear combinations because that's where uh, the beauty of this lies, right? So um, the first choice would be to create a general polynomial or a quadratic function um, so that, uh, that you introduce some sort of nonlinearity. So most of our classification and regression is basically a curve problem, right? And in most cases, um, the problem is, uh, and the problem statement is not, the classes in the problem statement is not uh, linearly separable. So you might want to go with um, the nonlinear approach, right? So in that case, this kind of um, nonlinear combination of all these things can help us get closer to what we want. And this is the interesting part. So you can actually use a simple ML model, the machine, le uh, machine learning model that can actually combine, that can actually learn how to combine these things so that once you have um, a target output, you can just model the target output uh, with this current ensemble and just train an ML model to find out what is the optimal combination of all these uh, different ensemble, the weights of these ensembles so that um, you uh, meet your requirement in the target data, right? Um, a more complex mechanism would be uh, using another neural network uh, that becomes the function approximator. Then, but this, uh, I wouldn't suggest this. This is very rarely used because neural networks obviously need a lot more information uh, to understand how to deal with um, intricacies within the ensembles to get us the outcome. Now, um, obviously, there are going to be drawbacks when you use uh, a machine learning model as an aggregator, right? So it becomes um, uh, it becomes a pros and cons game. So there are obviously pros uh, to use uh, an ML model as an aggregator because uh, obviously it can learn a bit more and you can um, get closer to what you want. But there can be cons as well. And we look at the cons briefly. Uh, so the first thing is the crystal clear interpretability is lost. So if you were using a weighted average or a simple average or just a, a, a linear function, you could actually con control that, uh, control all the different parameters by yourself and see uh, what changes were being made by changing what in the actual uh, ensembling formula, right? So you, you have a predictability of how much the system can change given that you give a small perturbation inside the ensembling method. So when it comes to ML models, that interpretability is lost. Although you have uh, things such as feature importances that are intrinsic to um, machine learning models, um, that doesn't really give us the full picture, right? So in, um, we can't really be sure how much of a change inside one feature can lead uh, to a change in the actual output. That predictability is kind of lost. And um, obviously, uh, no ML model can be 100% accurate, right? So if you add another model in this pipeline of models, obviously the error will accumulate. So um, all these different models that made up part of the ensemble will have inherent errors, right? No model can be 100% accurate. And when you add another model in the pipeline, that just adds another source of error. And again, it becomes um, a kind of um, trade-off between whether you want um, interpretability and um, interpretability versus whether you want accuracy and better results. And um, also when you uh, add another model, if that model is computationally complex that can add to the processing part and there can be latency related issues. Um, 
So whenever you, uh, if your problem statement requires that it run in real time and you have to get decisions and results lightning quick, then you'll have to find out a way to mitigate this issue because um, mini models will have some sort of latency associated with it, especially when it's deployed uh, in a production environment. And if the size of the ensemble is small, then the model might not really learn that much that can make um, better predictions. So if there are only three on, um, if there are only three uh, models in the ensemble, then um, and if there are there are not much uh, there's not much variance in between the three uh, different uh, parts of the ensemble, then machine learning models wouldn't be able to learn much that will have actually make a difference in uh, as regards the uh, the accuracy, the final accuracy. It might just be the same as uh, the best performing model that was part of your ensemble. Uh, let's just look at some of the um, ensembles uh, examples of uh, ensembling that we have, and um, for example, image captioning systems, right? So they have both uh, convolutional neural nets, which um, you, which are used for image recognition, and also sequential models, which are LSTMs and GRUs, uh, which are used for text generation. So uh, an image captioning system is an ensemble of a CNN and an RNN, which is trained in an end-to-end -end fashion. And uh, when I say trained in an end-to-end fashion, it means that you feed it so the image is just the raw, um, the data is just the raw image, and uh, the target variable, the target would be just the raw um, statement or uh, the English sentence that actually uh, translates from that uh, image. So both of these are trained um, together. So the CNN and uh, RNN are, um, RNN are trained together. Sequential model is trained together to find out um, what particular mapping of CNN gives the image properly and what particular mapping within uh, the sequential model gives uh, the proper text. And it has to do this in conjunction with each other. It's not that, that one is trained separately and the other is trained separately. Both of them are trained uh, simultaneously. That's being trained end to end. And this is uh, much more closer to home, which is conversation. Um, conversations, um, they are na they're natural to humans, but uh, when you uh, try to um, devise some sort of mechanism to solve conversations um, using computer-based approaches, it becomes a bit more complex because there are a lot of different aspects to language, right? The syntactic part, the informative part, um, and the semantic part, right? So um, let's just uh, briefly dive into how you can uh, use ensembling in uh, conversations. So um, it can be, uh, conversations can be broken down to two broad levels. So one is the language-based uh, aspect of conversation and the other is uh, the information-based aspect of conversation. So when you're breaking down language, so, and um, that's the purpose of ensembling, right? Breaking down one big problem into several, several sub-problems. And we've divided it into two now, which is language and, um, and information. So language itself, again, is pretty complex. There has to be grammatical correctness. There has to be structural integrity. There has to be semantic validity. So all these are different, different problems um, that we will be encountering while you're trying to break down language, right? So uh, it becomes a good idea um, to somehow, um, if you have one single model that can learn all of this together, very good. But uh, in most of the cases, um, one single model won't be able to do that in many cases when it comes to human to human conversations. So you might want to think about breaking this problem into these three different parts and try to solve them individually. And uh, when it comes to the informational part, it's all about context, right? And context can be briefly be broken down into entity detection, entity linkages, uh, co-reference chains, and uh, basic informational content. So for example, if uh, there was a statement uh, that was um, Leo Messi plays for FC Barcelona. In this, uh, Leo Messi is an entity, FC Barcelona is an entity, and the linkage between these entities is plays for, right? So that's how these entities are linked. And uh, co-reference is about uh, pronouns, like what it refers to in a conversation or what that refers to in a conversation and stuff like that. And uh, this is essentially how uh, context is broken down. Um, and these are actually individual, so these are actually um, research areas in themselves, all of these uh, individual problems, entity detection, the co-referential part, all these are actually individual sub-problems which, um, which are research areas in themselves. Um, and um, when I said about the, the language, um, the language part of it, right, grammatical correctness, structural integrity, semantic validity. So we have uh, this basic notion that a language model um, can learn this and uh, it is true to an extent, but how true is it? And let's just look at um, how practical it is. Um, we know that we know for a fact that it can uh, learn all of that, but let's just see how practical it is. So language models and uh, liabilities. So suppose you're a data scientist and you're working on a problem that has to use model. You're all happy, like 
Capri here smiling and walking down the street, about to use a language model that you're sure that you can solve your problem. But then you encounter this guy, uh, the LM size and the number of parameters, who says, not today, right? You shall not pass because all these models are really very, very huge and it becomes a problem. So what we know for a fact is LMs are adept at finding grammar and also context to a certain extent. But the thing is, uh, we still don't have complete clarity on which parts of the actual network do that. Uh, for example, for BERT, uh, we we know uh, we um, we can't just query one layer of BERT and expect us uh, expect to get uh, the context of a statement or um, the entities that were associated with it. There have been um, uh, probing. Uh, there have been um, research papers that are a basic attempt at probing probing BERT so that we can find out what each individual layer in each individual sub part of that network actually does. But still, again, uh, it comes down to that basic problem we were defining in the start, um, lack of interpretability when it comes to the brain and uh, the neural net. We don't have crystal clear understanding of what is actually happening in the back end. And uh, as uh, as the team mentioned, there's this general trend of ever expanding language models, but itself was 120 million parameters big, the, the base BERT model, right? And it becomes a Herculean task to actually put uh, kind of these things into production. It can be done, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it becomes um, a tiring task. And um, uh, another thing is um, when you, uh, so uh, you can argue that if you fine tune a language model that has learned a lot from previous data on your particular problem, you can actually, um, uh, you can actually use that information it learned from the language model training onto uh, whatever problem you're trying to solve, right? But there's this particular thing called the catastrophic forgetting, and I think most of you might be aware of this. And this was a, a term that was introduced by Sebastian Ruder and uh, Jeremy Howard in um, their paper on uh, universal language model, uh, which was released in 2018 or so. So uh, basically, what it says is that um, if you don't control uh, your fine tuning process, there, there can be something called catastrophic forgetting, where it, the neural network, the language model, just forgets what it learned from all that data uh, during the training phase of the language model. And the fine tuning has to be carefully controlled so that uh, the information that it learned uh, previously is preserved. And also, um, and also it has to learn from this new data that you're exposing it to, right? So it becomes a, a balancing act between what it learned and what it has to learn. And that can be a very, very tricky process. But the thing is in very, in very specific use cases, in some of the use cases, using a language model as such uh, without any fine tuning, uh, using the different parts of the language model as such without fine tuning in tandem with other custom made models that actually fit your problem segment. That can actually work wonders because um, uh, we have had experience with uh, using pre-trained models in tandem with our own models without any um, fine tuning because fine tuning, as I said, can be a slippery slope, right? Um, you can actually uh, make a custom model uh, and ensemble it with these pre-trained models that are available that can amass um, huge loads of training data that has information that it collected from there. And you can actually do this um, provided that uh, you have broken down the problem into its simplest form, its different simple forms, and actually sorry, combining them together so that um, you get, uh, you try, you, you're that much closer to um, what you're trying to solve. And Thank you for bearing with me. It's finally over. Just a couple of slides left. We'll draw to a close. Um, so in the beginning, I had asked you a question about um, how likely it is uh, for general intelligence to come before 2050, right? So this is a survey from experts on this field, and this has been conducted um, over two to three different years, 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, and uh, what experts say that, what researchers in this field uh, say that is even a 50% chance of attaining artificial general intelligence is elusive. So um, the most uh, re the most um, optimistic estimate is by 2060, and the most pessimistic is by 2099 or never. So there are actually a lot of researchers who believe that that can never be achieved, as in a system can't um, be as intelligent as a human. There are researchers who believe that. And another interesting article I read was that AI entrepreneurs they actually believe that um, artificial general intelligence will be available before 2050 but the actual researchers who do it actually beg to differ and they say that it's 2060 to 2099 and it can be anywhere near that. And uh, there's this beautiful line in Iron Man 2, I don't know if you see the movie, but uh, there's this beautiful line which Howard Stark says that he's limited by the technology of his time. Um, Howard Stark uh, uh, 
just um, creates an element, the structure of an element, but he doesn't have the technology to actually make it, right? And it's the job of um, Tony Stark 20, 30 years later, uh, who actually builds it using the technology of that time. So we are indeed limited by the technology of the time, but that, does that mean that we should actually stop research and just um, quit and just call it quits, like stop all data science work? Absolutely not. But what we can do at the moment is that we can actually break down this, break down these complex problems into these uh, different different sub problems, which probably already have um, a solution in some form. And I'm I'm a firm believer in the statement that there's nothing new under the sun. So whatever you thought of, it has already been there, and whatever problems are there has been there, and people have tried to solve it. There's nothing called a new problem. There's nothing new under the sun. So. This problem, so all these individual sub problems might already be having some sort of solution to them. And it's just basically our job to find out what these individual sub models are and uh, try to combine them in the best possible manner so that we can get close to our, uh, our business requirements or whatever. And um, as a data scientist, I believe that um, a lot of us can actually benefit from reading more about the human brain, right? Because I still believe that is the OG intelligence, right? And uh, we can actually learn a lot. And this was actually suggested, these books were actually suggested to me by one of my cousins, who, who coincidentally is also the one who pushed me into data science. And he's also a psychologist. Um, so um, these books, Phantoms in the Brain and Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook, mistook his wife for a hat. So that actually gives us um, a, bit, a bit of a clearer picture into how the human brain functions and how perception in general is created, how the brain predicts given how the brain makes predictions um, given some data. So yeah, as data scientists, I think we should uh, be inspired by the OG intelligence. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. And with that, um, I conclude and um, I hand it over to Mayur for, uh, for the steps. So thank you all for bearing with me. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, that was quite descriptive. And thank you very much, Faker, for that. And with that, we have um, quite a number of questions, actually. So let me start with the first one from Chitra. And she would like to know, what do you mean by hybrid intelligence? Could you elaborate on that? OK, right. Um, I think, yeah, um, sure. So hybrid intelligence is when you have, um, so there are basically, um, I, can, I can basically divide intelligence into two broad categories right, over here. Right? One is conventional intelligence, and one is um, machine learning or deep learning based intelligence. Conventional intelligence is where uh, you have um, a, an algorithm or um, a set of rules which was actually developed by a human after going through some data himself. So that it's just a set of rules, uh, it's just a, a procedure to follow so that you can get to a final output, right? That is the conventional wisdom on one side. And on the other side, we have this machine learning based, data driven, data driven kind of um, intelligence. So hybrid intelligence act is actually mixing both of these together. So you have some knowledge that is gained from conventional intelligence in the form of algorithms, and you have this data driven approach, right? So, and as we saw, as we, the main theme of this presentation was that you can't solve a problem using just one methodology, right? So uh, when a problem statement becomes too complex, uh, you'll have to break it down. So, and data driven approaches can only go so far. It can only learn from the data that it's fed, right? And um, in, in most cases, it falls short of what we actually wanted to do, right? But um, there is hope in this conventional um, intelligence that has been around for ages, right? Um, algorithms in general, because um, that was actually the result of the human brain actually working problems out. And this will actually be very good at uh, uh, finding those specific exceptions that these particular um, data-driven approaches can't fathom. And hybrid intelligence is when you mix these both together to get that final output in which you have the data-driven intelligence on one side and the conventional intelligence on the one side, on the other side, so that um, the problem statement becomes that much easier to solve and you get closer to your actual um, expected benchmark for that matter. So yeah, basically hybrid intelligence is using both of these sources of intelligence and then just merging them together. So that is what uh, we define to be um, hybrid intelligence. Uh, yeah. Cool. I'm sure that answers to this question. I think we have a limited time. So we're going to take one more question. Um, and this is from Swara. She, okay. So she says, can, so she asks, can context modeling be achieved when unsimilar approach? Oh, um, brilliant. Uh, so, um, 
context modeling. Oh, how do I put this? So it is kind of um, difficult um, to get to um, a human level performance when it comes to context modeling, right? Because we are just so good at it. The brain is just so good at it. And um, as I said, uh, context modeling, if you see it as a single problem, it can be very, very, very hard uh, to break it down. But when you try to um, make that into separate sub problems, uh, as we saw in terms of um, the informational content uh, in the set of sentences or the, or, or the text that you're processing, or um, the entities that are present or the linkages between entities or the co-reference mentioned. So when you break that down into these uh, individual sub problems, we already know for a fact that there has been at least some research in all of these uh, areas, right? And there has been some sort of progress in it, although not at that level, which we want it to be, but there has been, at least um, baby steps again um, in the in those particular areas. And uh, if you find uh, if you can uh, leverage that existing research and also use all of these models in tandem, uh, you can actually uh, get something that you don't have right now. As in, if you were to look at context as a single problem and try to solve it just like that, uh, probably you get maybe like forty percent accuracy. But if you break it down and uh, individually solve each of these separate sub problems, you can go much, much higher. Although um, caveat that um, it can't reach human level, uh, human, level, human level performances, but uh, this is the best bet uh, that we have right now. So context modeling through ensembling um, uh, has high, so it, it has a high probability of success compared to the other uh, conventional methods. So yeah, context modeling in a nutshell using ensembling um, can lead to better results. Yeah. Cool, Shikhar. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I think with that, we are done with the Q&A session, given that we have very limited time. Uh, I would encourage uh, uh, people to send their questions, if any, to meet up at symbol.ai, as I said in the beginning. And with this, um, uh, we conclude our session one. That's the first talk, and I'll hand it over to Roma. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Mayur. So, um, hey guys, thanks a lot, Shekhar. It was really interesting to hear about the functioning of the brain and the neural networks. Now it can be closely linked to NLP and conversational analysis in general. I'm sure after today's talk, I mean, all of us will be motivated to learn more about it and, you know, apply it for the other deep learning applications as well. Cool, now we'll now move on to our second speaker. She's Shraddha Sarana. Shraddha is a lead data scientist at ThoughtWorks. She has a keen interest in anything data, algorithms, science, and the brain. She's worked on various business domain projects like price optimization, predicting customer churn, text analysis, route optimization problems, and chatbots. She has also worked on research projects focusing on using machine learning for scientific discoveries in astrophysics and how in life sciences, having worked on applications development for some time, she is a proponent of applying all the good practices of agile development in data science. She likes to dabble in many domains from astronomy to genetics to, to agriculture and figure out ways of applying learnings from one domain to the other. Today, she'll be sharing the thoughts and learnings about writing star formation properties of galaxies using deep learning. Over to you, Shraddha. Hey, thanks, Roma. Yeah, um, so I'll just share my screen. Hey, everyone. I hope everyone's doing good and staying safe. Um, so today I'll be talking about the work that we did in the astrophysics domain where we used deep learning to predict certain star formation properties. Uh, before I start, uh, I think Mayuru will just send out a poll so that I can uh, get an understanding of uh, uh, what the general uh, audience knowledge is on deep learning and in astrophysics. Yes, yeah, Shraddha. So the poll is live. Cool. Looks like you're enjoying it. Yeah. So we're getting more quotes. Yeah. 
let's wait for a couple of more seconds cool i think we have like 33 votes 78% votes okay cool um uh, i'm going to share the results now So let me know if you can see the results. Yeah, I can see the results. So uh, cool. It looks like most people have not uh, used deep learning before. Some would like to explore it. Um, few thirty percent have been working on it, and some are expert at it as well. But uh, since the majority have not uh, used deep learning earlier, that's the level I will speak at in today's meet. Um, well. Uh, if whether you are an astrophysicist or worked in a astronomy domain is a clean sweep uh, nobody has uh, so it'll be interesting uh, to talk and uh, sort of a little relieving as well for me because uh, i am i have collaborated with the uh, astrophysicist for a year and uh, it is difficult for me also to grasp everything so it's completely fine if you if there are parts that you don't uh, understand clearly as long as you get it at a high level that's very good okay i'm going to stop sharing Cool. All right. Um, then let's get started. So this is about uh, uh, predicting star formation properties of galaxies using uh, deep learning. Um, we did this work as part of the uh, E4R team that we have, which is Engineering for Research team at ThoughtWorks, um, where we try and apply all the uh, engineering principles that we discover by working on uh, technically challenging projects. And we want to share them and apply them um, with research institutes and organizations to help expedite uh, the science projects that they are doing. Yeah. Uh, and this particular project was in collaboration with uh, NCRA, which is the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, which is based out of Pune. Oops. All right. Um, so, before I started with this particular project, um, I thought that, all right, it's astrophysics. It's just one thing. Um, I'll keep it at an abstract level, and I can go ahead with the data science knowledge that I have. But as they say, when you don't know something, you think that it could be simple. It's just like a small thing. Only when I started entering it did I realize that uh, it's a vast field with several different domains inside it. Uh, the two most that I'm acquainted with are uh, galaxies and the solar. So galaxies is the field in, so this is not the proper uh, terminology for a field in astrophysics. Uh, but the field that studies with the galaxies in space, that is one particular stream. And then there is another stream that studies only the sun, the solar aspects. Um, these are the two that I'm quite acquainted with. And this particular talk, uh, we will talk about galaxies. So before that, um, the background image that you see over here is that of a radio telescope. This particular one is in Netherlands. And the small, uh, tiny person over here is me. And the only reason I'm appearing so big also is because I was uh, very in much in front of the telescope. So what is a radio telescope? Um, I'm sure everyone's aware of the optical telescope, which usually operates in the visible uh, length, wavelength, you see through it, things are magnified and you get an image or whatever. Uh, the largest uh, optical telescope that has been built is the TMT, the 30 meter telescope, um, which also uh, ThoughtWorks is building some control systems for it. What we are looking at is at the other end of the spectrum, which deals with the radio waves. So in the radio waves, the telescope that you saw above basically captures radio waves that are being emitted from space. Yeah, so it works in this end frequency range. And even in these radio waves, uh, radio frequency band can be divided into several mini bands. Yeah, so you can imagine this should be broken up into uh, 20, 30 bands. And uh, at these particular frequencies, uh, intensities are captured. So uh, when you look out at the night sky, uh, hopefully outside the city when there is not too much of a, when there is not too much light pollution, you will see a lot of 
specs, I would say. Now, some of these could be stars, but a vast majority are actually galaxies which are so far away that to us they seem as a point in sky, as a small speck in sky. So the radio telescope that I showed you, um, what they do is they point at these various uh, segments of the sky called surveys in the astronomy terms. They take a survey of that particular sky and record all the intensities observed in various parts of the sky. And not only the intensity, but the intensity at various frequency bands that I was talking about in the radio wave uh, band. Yeah. Now, these are what uh, are used to build various models that they have. So now uh, for a galaxy, um, astro uh, astrophysicists have been studying various properties of galaxies basically to enhance our understanding of the universe of the galaxies and maybe get something useful also out of it. Uh, there are various, so from the uh, 21 measurements that are done in the frequency bands, those can be analyzed to figure out various properties of the galaxies. And the three that we looked at was uh, a star formation rate, which is basically the rate at which new stars are formed in galaxies. So stars are forming and dying all the time. Um, our sun, which is a star, is quite a mediocre star, which is in its in-between phase. Um, so in a galaxy, uh, based on these intensities that are measured at various frequency bands, what is the star formation rate can be inferred. Similarly, what is the dust luminosity, luminosity in that galaxy? What is the stellar mass of the galaxy? So what is the average mass of the stars that are there in the galaxy? And then there is something called as uh, the hot temperature of the galaxy, the cold temperature of the galaxy, which we haven't looked at at the moment. So these are the three properties of galaxies which we were interested in estimating uh, using a deep learning model <clears throat> based on the flux values that we, um, that we had uh, in the radio frequency band. So of course there was a current way of estimating these properties. Um, there is a current model uh, which is called as the MACFIS model which is one of the most widely used SED fitting codes, uh, which has been successfully applied on galaxy samples, spanning a wide range of galaxies, stellar masses, star formation rates, and morphological types. So uh, what this is, if I am to say, um, so to predict, uh, to explain, uh, say, each of these dots, oops, I can't click. Each of these dots is a flux measurement that has been taken in different frequency bands. So you can see the blue dots, green dots going to the yellow and then going to the red dots. Uh, the bar is just the error range associated with that particular measurement. These measurements have been taken by radio telescopes. And for each particular galaxy, uh, the MACFIST model basically has millions of templates. And these templates are nothing but the green line that you see. Okay, that is a fitment. And they have millions of uh, such fitments based on past research, which they will try to fit on any new observations taken by the telescope in order to understand these properties of galaxies. Yeah. So in a sense, it is actually a brute force method where you have millions of templates and one by one you keep fitting them and then whichever fits the best, you take that template and based on that, um, the properties that we mentioned of star formation rates, stellar mass and dust luminosity are estimated. So now with the advent of uh, machine learning, deep learning, and also more importantly, the ability to collect and store huge amounts of data set has, uh, has introduced the use of machine learning in astrophysics. So astronomical data sets have grown exponentially in size. And uh, this is only going to get larger and larger. There are new telescopes that are being built in uh, Australia and South Africa, which are going to work uh, together in collaboration. And the data that it is going to uh, generate is going to be petabyte, petabytes of data in a single day. So it's nothing like we have seen before. So we will have so much of data and there are just not enough astronomers to actually analyze all of that data and to figure things out. So the uh, applicability of machine learning is getting more and more important in this domain. And there is lots of information that is packed in the data collected. 
because we are collecting data of something unknown, uh, we don't know what data is going to be useful, what is not going to be useful. So to start with, we would like to store as much data as possible and we would like to analyze every data that we have collected so that we haven't missed anything, right? So now coming to deep learning. Um, so we've established that machine learning will be inevitable um, for the astronomical data sets. And the best part about the uh, astronomy, astronomy community I like is that they are free to share the data. Uh, they do want to analyze the data first themselves and be able to publish a paper. Uh, but post that, it is uh, free and available to everyone to analyze and discover things. Uh, so that's very nice. So um, coming back to machine learning and deep learning. So deep learning networks uh, generally perform very well in capturing the non-linearity of the data. Deep learning is a type of uh, machine learning which is inspired by the way our brain works. So our brain has several neurons that communicate with each other in, uh, in their synapses. And uh, neural networks can be thought of along the similar lines. Deep learning is uh, sort of the new name that caught on for artificial neural networks. Uh, there are many types of artificial neural networks, hence there are many <clears throat> types of deep learning as well. Uh, so deep learning has been successfully applied in uh, various classification problems of astronomy. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, there was this Galaxy Zoo project which actually um, crowdsourced inputs from many people from all over the world and then use those to actually classify what sort of a galaxy the particular image was, whether it was a spiral galaxy or a bar-shaped galaxy, etc. Um, just a second. Yeah, so deep learning has <clears throat> mostly been applied to classification problems where there are particular classes in the end and we want to classify whether it belongs to type A, type B, uh, what we have done is uh, we have used it as a regression problem statement when we are predicting, uh, we are estimating a particular value. So let's talk about the data. Uh, the data that we used is called as the gamma survey. It's a spectroscopic survey which has about uh, 3 lakh galaxies in it. So for 3 lakh galaxies, there are fluxes for 21 bands. And then um, for each galaxy, the catalog includes the positional information where in the uh, sky that particular galaxy came. Uh, the 21 flux um, uh, band flux values, which I was talking about in the radio frequency, if you divide it into 21 bands. So what was the intensity measured at each of those 21 bands? That is what is recorded along with the individual errors. So also what could be the instrument error for each uh, record? Yeah, um, then there was a spectroscopic redshift. And also um, now this particular data had the stellar mass star formation rate and dust luminosity, which had been earlier estimated by the MACFIS model, right? So what uh, we intend to do is to create a deep learning model that will sort of mimic the MACFIS model because it is impossible to ever actually go and be able to measure the stellar mass or the star formation rate or dust luminosity. It's, it's impossible, right? So uh, the best is the estimates that we can get. Uh, and these estimates have been derived by the MACFIS model. Now for constructing our deep learning model, we used uh, data of the 21 band. Uh, we did not use the error associated with the band. That is something that we intend to do uh, as next steps. So these consisted of the far UV lights, uh, the five Sloan digital sky survey bands. So this is the UGRIZ band, the infrared bands, the WISE bands, and the Herschel bands. Uh, so these are just names given to the different bands in the radio frequency space. It, it is also possible to build models based on uh, individual bands itself, but we took, a, we took all the 21 bands to get a better prediction. So uh, our first thing was to actually, uh, from the data that we have, to figure out what sample we want to use. Uh, we do want to maximize the number of samples to be given to the model because more the amount of data, uh, better chances that the data will, uh, the model will fit to the data. 
but at the same time we do not want noisy samples now keep in mind that these are radio telescopes that are trying to measure intensities of far off galaxies okay um they will be susceptible to many other signals in its vicinity so one of the things that is uh, that is taken care around these sites is to have as little human population around um because even our phones we always have some signal going on some telescopes are so sensitive that even when you start a car the vibration that it creates uh, the telescope can actually capture that so these are all noise that gets added to our telescopes so we wanted to also take only the values which have a high signal to noise ratio that is the signal uh, measured is much higher than the noise measured around it however one of the things that we found difficult is that it is impossible to have a high signal to noise ratio for all the 21 bands if we do that then the number of data that we will be giving to the model will be very less so we tuned our model in such a way to get a good trade off of the number of data that we can use and the quality of data and here the quality of data are all the measurements that have a signal to noise ratio of 3 or more yeah um so now we have a trade off between obtaining good predictions while only reducing the sample size by a small fraction so we can make use of as many observations as possible and also now if, when this model goes into production so this is the training phase where we have trained the model we have tested that okay it is giving us good enough accuracy and now in the production when the uh, radio telescopes actually measure take measurements of uh, the flux values it can be given to the model and the model can figure out if there are at least at least 6 out of the 21 flux measurements have a good signal to noise ratio of greater than 3 we can go ahead and have confidence in the estimation of our model okay. so a galaxy is excluded from a sample only because it occupies a sparsely populated region of the parameter space or it has flux measurements that are missing or unreliable so this is how a deep neural network looks like we have some input values so this is where our 21 flux values will go in we have hidden layers in between this is something that um, we given as inputs we call them as hyperparameters they have some activation function associated with them and this activation function basically tells uh, how the input from the in between the arrows that you can see is called the weight matrix how these values get transformed to the next layer so there will so this particular node will have i hope everyone can see my cursor so this particular node will have incoming values these values are subjected to an activation function such as relu is one of the activation functions and then this node will have an output and this gets propagated through the layers up to the final layer okay and in the final layer so we created three separate models to predict each of the three star formation parameters which can give an estimate in the continuous region space of number as to uh, what the value could be so based on a lot of trial and experimentation and uh, based on also understanding uh, the domain information from the uh, collaborator we had at ncra we figured out what these values should be uh so we did get uh, quite good results uh, we were quite happy with it for example for uh, stellar mass if you see uh we almost cannot distinguish between the line of best fit uh so let me start so on the x axis are the actual values of stellar mass while on the y axis is the one predicted by our deep learning model so most of them lie around the straight line yeah so we have a 45 degree line which is the black line and we have a line of best fit based on our predictions and you can see that those lines almost overlap each other there are a few outliers if you see these small specks of gray where there is quite a mismatch between uh, the stellar mass which was given by the macfest model and that our model was predicting and this is just a zoomed in version of the same thing where on the y axis instead of the value predicted by our deep learning model we have given the error yeah so you can see in some cases the error is quite high uh, up to minus 
but also to keep in mind over here is that uh, the scale that you see is in the log logarithmic region. So we are predicting over three orders of magnitude from nine to 12, which is quite a large region space. And in this, we are able to estimate almost within 0 0.06 for most of the data points. So that is a very good achievement, which means that this model can actually be used practically. And uh, in regions of uh, parameter space, of this particular parameter space, where the MACFIS is a poor model of the underlying physical reality, our deep learning model will also be a poor representation of the physical reality. The reason being that we are trying to mimic the MACFIS model itself. So the mistakes of the MACFIS model do sort of get transferred to our deep learning model as well. Uh, but the real interesting point would come for uh, these galaxies that you see, which are way far off the best fit line, which has a higher error. Okay, so these are the galaxies of interest where we can go and actually figure out which galaxy it is, what are the other properties of the galaxies, why the MACFIS model is predicting something, and why our deep learning model is predicting uh, quite a difference in that particular value. Because the deep learning models are built to be able to generalize well. Uh, and what I mean by be able to generalize well is that uh, when a machine learning model is trained a lot on a particular data set, it tends to fit a lot on that data set, but not on others. It's like, uh, it's like students giving exam when they read on a particular chapter very thoroughly or rather they mug up, they can answer questions of that particular chapter very well, but anything that comes out of syllabus and they would need to think about it, they'll be, uh, they fare very bad at it. Versus another student who actually understands the concepts behind it will not only be able to answer questions that were in the chapter, but also those which are out of syllabus, but still related to the same topic. So it's the same way. Uh, all machine learning models uh, are tried to be generalized models so that they understand the concept of patterns in the data and they can predict those out of syllabus questions as well. And they can be correct uh, in those estimates as well. Um, and since this particular deep learning model is also trained to be generalized, it would be interesting to see why the deep learning model is predicting something. Has it understood some uh, underlying physical concept from the data, uh, which probably was missed by MACFIS, um, probably unlikely because uh, there's been so many years of research by so many scientists in the area. Nevertheless, it is interesting to see uh, why these galaxies with particular errors. And who knows if there is something unique about the galaxy, it might be something new that has been discovered. So that's the really uh, interesting part of this whole project. So why do we want to mimic the MACFIS model itself? It is there, it is doing the job. It has so much, uh, so many years of research behind it. Uh, it's because uh, the MACFIS model takes approximately 10 minutes per galaxy to estimate the parameters that I just spoke about. So that would mean that if you want to predict for a million of galaxy, it would take about 2.5 months. And mind you that uh, when we start, so when we look up in the sky, uh, we don't see most of the stars and galaxies uh, because of light pollution and also because uh, we are only limited to seeing in the uh, visible light region. There is a lot of interesting stuff happening in the radio frequency region, also in the gamma and X-ray regions. Um, but those, the travel length is less um, if you see the physics. Um, but for, uh, in the radio domain, it gets very interesting because those waves can travel a lot. And long distance travel in this case also means that when we capture those waves, we've also captured something that goes back in time. Right. Um, so actually, these millions of galaxies are probably can be uh, recorded by the radio telescopes in like uh, one inch square or something. So the telescopes can record millions and billions of galaxies in the survey. And two and a half months to be able to estimate these parameters, which can then be used to make certain predictions is a lot of time to from actually uh, capturing the data to analyzing, to be able to make some discovery or estimate. So for us, while the training phase of the deep learning model takes about five to 30 minutes, depending on which parameter we are trying to train it on, uh, once it has been trained, it just takes a few seconds to estimate these parameters for millions of galaxies. 
now these estimates going forward can also have a confidence level associated with them so if the deep learning model has a high confidence 90 95 uh, then we can just go ahead and use those particular values while if the deep learning model has a low confidence um, of say 50 60 percent which could be the case for these uh, values which are way far away from the line for those then only those particular galaxies can also be run on the MACFIS model to figure out if there is a really a big difference in between what the MACFIS model would predict and what a deep learning model would predict. So with this, we hope that uh, we will also accelerate in our understanding of the galaxy evolution and hence the universe. So actually, I think I've already covered this. What's next is that the anomalous results can further be investigated to either improve the model or better understanding the physical underlying uh, physics, which are there in it. Um, so that's all I had. Um, it'd be good if you were able to take at least some out of it. Uh, I'll take any questions now. By the way, uh, detail, uh, detail of this uh, work has been published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. It's a leading journal in the astrophysics domain. Uh, and that paper has all the details related to the model and the work that we have done. Thank you. And I shall take your questions now. Oh, thank you very much, Shraddha. That was quite a script again. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. So I'll start with the first question. Uh, it's from Bhavesh and uh, he says, he's asking, how do you decide which algorithm to use for backprop and other hyperparameters? Right, so we actually tried quite a few algorithms. Um, we tried random forest, we tried, um, which other, it's been quite a few months, but we tried four or five algorithms, including deep learning, and we zeroed down on deep learning simply because it is able to uh, capture the nonlinearity in the data much better. So if you look at the initial template, so there are hints in the data and the existing work uh, itself that has been done where you can see that uh, these are the input values, the, the uh, points that you see. And uh, the output is basically the SED fitting, which is the green line. And there is, when you look at it uh, at a first glance, there does not seem to be much of a logic. I mean, there would be based on what so many people have applied and created these fittings, uh, but it's not linear. So there is a lot of non-linearity which is present, which needs to be captured. And hence we thought deep learning would do well and it gave very good results as well. Which is why we went ahead with uh, deep learning. But usually in any problem, we would try out at least a few models. Cool. I hope that answers Howard's question. Uh, we got another one from Sagar. Um, he asked, what is the target or dependent variable in deep learning model that you trained? Right, so it was uh, these values that we were trying to predict, um, which is the star formation rate, the dust luminosity, and the stellar mass. So we used the flux values that were measured by the radio telescopes as the inputs, as the independent variables. And these three were the dependent variables, but we trained three separate models for each of the three. We also tried training one model that can predict each, all these three parameters because there is some interdependency in these parameters as well. And we thought that uh, that could be captured nicely. But it turns out that uh, there are some differences as well, which one model is not able to capture for all the, amongst all the three. So yeah, so these three are the uh, dependent parameters, the target variables. Cool. Um... There's another question from Pratik, and that's quite an interesting one. Mm -hmm. What are the percentage of anomalies in the data that you received? Uh, did, you ha did you have to use any anomaly elimination methods? Uh, so the method that we used to subset the data was more um, related to the signal to noise ratio because it was difficult to get quality data. But we did have some anomalies and the way we decided to remove those were more uh, um, based on the domain expert suggestions. So we did have filters on each of these parameters actually. So stellar mass, for example, I'll take the, oh yeah, I'll take the example of stellar mass because, um, so over here, as you can see, we've taken stellar mass from nine to 12, okay, which is good enough range and covers most of the galaxies. However, we did have some galaxies which uh, were uh, 
unphysical, if that is a word to say, to exist. So those were likely measurement errors or something else which has happened processing error. Uh, and those are the ones that we have removed. The same applies for the others as well. And these values we got uh, uh, because the person we were collaborating with, he is an expert in this field. So he knew that these are the boundaries to be kept. Cool. Cool. Um, we've got another question from Ankit. And the question is, what are the data points that are finally fed to the deep learning models? Is it like the image data or the tabular data? It's a tabular data. It's the intensity value. So in a row, um, so each row represents a galaxy and uh, each column is the flux intensity value. Cool. I hope that answers this question. Uh, we will take one more question. That's the last question for the day, for the session. It's from Margadeep Das. And he asked, what exactly in deep learning was used? It has multiple techniques. Also, what's ensembling considered? Yeah. Uh, so interestingly, for this particular uh, problem statement, uh, we started off with a simple deep learning model, which was uh, just a deep learning with many hidden layers and uh, uh, number of neurons. And we played around with the activation functions. Uh, then we started regularizing and we started looking into uh, other deep learning networks. And uh, interestingly, the best one was the simplest one. So we went ahead with the simple deep uh, neural network architecture that you're seeing on the screen right now. So even things like when we try to regularize by uh, using dropout and all, it started giving worse results. So sometimes uh, simple works the best. Cool. Um, yeah, and with that, I think we're done with all the questions for the session. Uh, thank you very much for answering all the questions. Uh, it's been like a long session. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to Roma. Thanks a lot, Mayur. Thanks, Radha. It was really fascinating to know how deep learning can be implemented to know more about the parameters that are involved in galaxy evolutions. And seriously, it was really compelling, you know, how such complex problems in astronomy can be solved using these data science principles. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, uh, now, let's conclude with you. I'd like to thank you all for attending our meetup. I hope that the knowledge that was shared by our today's speakers helps us all in some or the other way, maybe in sh shaping our careers as data scientists or in just being, you know, well aware practitioners of deep learning. If you have any feedback or questions or suggestions about what you would like to hear from us next, please drop an email at meetup at symbol.ai. You can also follow us on, symbol, uh, on our Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram to know more about the next meetup that we'll be soon hosting. It was an immense pleasure to have you all here. And now it's finally time to bid adieu. Please do stay safe from COVID-19 and take care of yourself. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.